they know they're exempt, but the citizens don't know. So they can run a very nice dictatorship, okay, well maybe a not so nice one, but they, they can run a dictatorship over the citizens only. Why the ones that are people, they, they know they're free. I remember listening to United Nations speeches one time, it was back in the 50s. I wish today I had a transcript of this. It was really beautiful. This man representing, he was a representative of, of a small country that was being somehow attacked by another country. And he was talking about the freedom of the people. He's talking about the rights of the people. How, you know, we should live in peace. We should be, we should not have to be attacked by this. And he's, all there, it, it, he's talking about justice, right? And he got through his speech and then all of a sudden he stopped. It was just like the brakes went on. He suddenly stopped and there was a moment of silence. And then he said, well, he says now, he says, I'm not talking about the little people. And then he went on to say, and I can't remember the words he used, but in effect what he said was, they're just cannon fodder. Okay? <laughs> cannon fodder. You know, cannon fodder? You can stuff them in a cannon and use them for, for uh, bullets or something. You know, what well, basically he's saying is they, and he, he, he realized that when he, he was going too far on this, and, he, and whoever he had to pay attention to for his salary might think that he is suddenly undermining their sovereignty, right? <laughs> and, and somehow granting power to the people. So he immediately corrected himself. Like I said, I wish I had a transcript of that because it, it was so beautiful how he expressed it. And, uh, but that's what it is. In, in a republic, the, in a republic um, the people are free. Now, if everybody knows he's one of the people, then everybody's free. Now, you see, in a republic, in a republic, whatever rules are created by vote or by legislature, they're advisory. In a democracy, they're mandatory. Isn't that a great difference? In a republic, the rules are advisory. With one exception. That exception is, if 100% of society is against you, then it becomes mandatory. So, that's the dividing line between mandamus and just advice. Advisory. Okay. So, to deprive the people of their sovereignty, it is first necessary to get the people to agree to submit to the authority of the entity they have created. That is done by getting them to claim they are citizens of that entity. Okay? So, 14th Amendment. If you are born or naturalized and subject, then you are a citizen. Otherwise, you must be a people. Okay? Want to repeat about advisory and mandatory. In a democracy, whatever rules are passed, they're mandatory on all citizens, on everybody, okay? Majority rule. In a republic, whatever the majority says, that's advisory on the minority. What a difference, huh? Okay. <clears throat> the particular meaning of the word citizen is frequently dependent on the context in which it is found. And the word must always be taken in the sense which best harmonizes with the subject matter in which it is used. So that's something you've got to watch out for. Don't get locked into a single meaning on some of these technical words. Just exactly what is a citizen? Well, look at the text around it to figure it out. Okay? There is no concrete single meaning to these words. So, what is a person? Sometimes, some people say, gee, if you say you're a person, you're admitting you're a citizen. Not true. Because what's the definition of a court? A court is the person and suit of the sovereign. So there you have the word person being, sued, being used in a, in a sovereign sense. Can you repeat that? Hard to hear you there. Oh. Yeah. Well, do you want it on or off? Okay, well then somebody go chase down the management and see if they can turn it off. We, we have to delegate that job. Okay. So, um, 
Okay, you wanted, what was it you wanted repeated now? Which was? Is that what I said? The last thing? Sovereignty? Well, it's the, the, a court is the person and the suit of the sovereign. So the word person, in that sense, is a sovereign sense. A person is sovereign. So you have to look at the context in which it's used. On the website, there's an article about how the Supreme Court used, has used dictionaries. It's a great article. Yeah, blocked out the, the noise. Okay. You see, a, a, uh, when the... you got to remember that there's a common law maxim which says that substance over, overcomes form or form is less than substance. Okay? So, you got to understand that I have a thought in my head and my problem is, is to communicate that thought to you. The thought is the substance. The means of communicating it are called words. And the words are a mere form. It's my attempt, my choice of words is my attempt to transfer that thought over to you. So, when the Supreme Court looks at a word, if, every, if, if there's some disagreement on the meaning of the word, the, diction, the dictionary doesn't really play uh, a solid part in the decision. The Supreme Court will go look at, the dic- look at the meaning, the usage, the context in which it's used, and based on that, it will come up with its conclusions, whatever it is. So, the court does not just blindly take a dictionary and say, oh, this is what it means, therefore the law applies like this. It looks to a lot of things. It looks at legislative intent when the law was first made. It looks at the intent of the parties if there's a contract dispute. It looks at a lot of things because it's looking for the substance. The word is a mere form representing the real whatever it is you're talking about. Okay? So, when you read your words, don't just blindly assume that all these technical words have single meanings. Now, this actually leads into which came first, the chicken or the egg problem, you know. You have to have an education in English in order to understand the law, and you have to understand the law in order to understand how, how to build the English language. Okay? So, there's some, at some point you have to say, well, okay, there's a common understanding and we use these forms and we accept these forms until somebody disagrees. Then we have to hash out what it means. Okay, here's one that I really like. The very meaning of sovereignty is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. Okay? If you can't make laws, then you're not sovereign. If you can't run your own house, you're not sovereign. Okay? That was American Banana Company versus United Fruit Company. But that's, that is what sovereignty is, the very meaning of sovereignty. The decree of the sovereign makes law. So what I say in my lawsuits, the law of the case is decreed as follows. I have yet to have anybody challenge that. Isn't that interesting? You know, they read over that and then they go down to my list of laws and they come in with their own laws. But when they come in their own laws, they don't decree it. What they do is they, they cite the codes. Well, that's not law. <laughs> By the way, why are the codes called codes? They're not law. Why are the statutes called statutes? They're not law either. Sometimes they refer to the law code or sometimes they they refer to the uh, statutory law to help confuse you. But the fact of the matter is they're not law. What is law? Law, in the absence of any clarification, law means common law. Now, if you see it called statutory law, you know they're not talking about common law. Um, well, I guess a good place to start would get a, uh, um, on your, on the disc that you'll get, 
and on the website you can link to the, the congressional copy. You can look at the book called uh, The Constitution of the United States of America, Analysis and Interpretation. Now that book is about 2,700 pages and if you go to that specific section of um, where it talks about um, the judicial branch and where it says the judicial power of the United States is uh, something to the effect available to all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution. And you might look up there in their explanation of what in law means. Now, that's probably where you'd find it. it. That would be my first research step. I haven't done that, but that's my instincts. Okay. But you have an actual case. You might even go look up that case. But the very meaning of sovereignty is, is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. Well, what's law? They might get into it there on that case, since it's a landmark case. Okay, a landmark case means a case that is especially important that everybody respects. Okay, pardon? It hasn't been overturned. It hasn't been overturned. That's another thing. Speaking of overturning, okay, you can shepherdize your case. Now, Mr. Shepherd uh, spent a good portion of his lifetime analyzing cases and deciding which cases overrided which cases. Well, eventually that grew to a big effort and now they have a... a set of books that are regularly, regularly published and what you can do is you can look up a specific case and find out if there are any other cases that have overridden that case. Okay, that's called shepherdizing. Now, what's interesting is this, is that if you are the sovereign and you decree the law or if you decree that this case is your law, then shepherdizing means nothing. Okay? Who's boss again? Who's the tribunal? Who's making judgment? Shepherdizing doesn't mean a thing. Okay? Shepherdizing... Now, I might shepherdize a case sometime if I have some doubt as to it. But see, my cases tend to be very fundamental. There's a, there is a uh, maxim in common law that says that the law does not uh, no, entertain trifles. Okay? In other words, for example of a trifle would be, let's say that you stepped on somebody's lawn and then you got off the lawn and now the owner of the lawn is going to sue you for breaking a blade of grass. That would be a trifle. Now, the reason I picked that example is because that's exactly what I read a Supreme Court justice say one time. Okay. So, that's, a, you know, small points we're not going to bother with. You're not going to sue somebody for a dime. All right. So, um, we don't bother with trifles. Okay, small points. Don't worry about it. But if you got something major, my lawsuits all deal with very basic, clear stuff. You understand when somebody got was wrong. A person was arrested for what? Who got hurt? Nobody. Who cares? You know? That I deal with fundamental stuff. I don't mess with trifles either. There are some people who absolutely, you know, every little thing is a violation to them. Well, those people are gonna have a hard life. But you you have to at some point you have to acknowledge that uh, some problems you just don't bother with, you know. Not worth it. Reservation of sovereignty. We went into that. Okay? Your sovereignty cannot be contracted away from you. We went through that. So, I don't think we have to cover Marion <coughs> versus uh, Jicarilla Apache tribes. Okay. The United States and the state of California are two separate sovereignties, each do do dominant within its own sphere. Okay? Separate sets of rules. And then they describe here's a, a county as a person in a legal sense. Okay? A person is such not because he is human but because rights and duties are ascribed to him. Okay? You are only a person if there are rights and duties assigned to you. Now I want you to understand something. This word right 
there's there's a word that that uh, gets abused a lot because <coughs> if I'm tribunal, <coughs> a right means something like a natural right, God given cannot be denied. There's no authority that can take that right away from me. But if a right is granted by a government, that's actually a privilege. Okay? So, I would reread the sentence to say a person is, not, is such not because he's human, but because privileges and duties are ascribed to him. He's given a privilege and he owes duties back. Okay? Okay? So, that, to be a person, by that definition, is to be a citizen, basically. And the terms citizen and citizenship are distinguishable from resident or inhabitant. Okay? And from domicile. Okay, I just made it larger, that's why it went off screen. Okay? Right at the top. Yeah. Government, Republican government. Well, that's, here it is. Government, Republican, uh, specifically Republican government, one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people and are exercised by the people, either directly or through their representatives chosen by the people to whom those powers are specially delegated. And there are the cases that support it. Okay? So, you, you want to make sure you're in a republic. <clears throat> All right? And if you're in a republic, then these other definitions fall in place. Can I move, can I move to a different page now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then we have the democracy defined, and that's it for that page. Okay. Okay. What was what? Yeah, that was under uh, sovereignty. I think. Or is it Republic versus Democracy? No, we weren't in, in that one. No. I don't think so. No, this is something else. Okay. I think we were in sovereignty when we found that. Anyhow... <clears throat> Republic versus democracy. Do you know the difference? Well, you do now, I guess. Okay. Uh, let's look at the California admission to the Union. And there's probably a similar one for your state. Okay. <clears throat> Whereas the people of California have presented a constitution and asked admission into the Union, which constitution was submitted to Congress by the President of the United States by message date February 13, 1850, and which on due examination is found to be Republican in its form of government, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the state of California shall be one and is hereby declared to be one of the United States of America and admitted into the Union on an equal footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever, or whatever. And it be further enacted that until the representatives in Congress shall be apportioned and so on, okay, get some other stuff. But you see, it's a legal concept. The Constitution guarantees to each state a Republican form of government. That's the federal Constitution. And before we could join in, they examined our Constitution to see if it really was Republican. Congress made a determination that it is Republican, and so they said, okay, you can join the club. But I remember reading somewhere, that in 1879, they voted on this other constitution. And that other constitution, from what I've been told, I haven't really analyzed it or checked it out, but my understanding is that the second constitution had never been approved by Congress. Federal, if you federal Congress, is that what you're talking about? Exactly. The only Congress. Okay, so that's the, that is the uh, admission. Okay. Now let's kind of cover a court of record here, briefly. 
<clears throat> what is a court of record? Well, I guess uh, I can't show that in full size. All right. Five requirements to a court of record. Keeps a record of the proceedings. That's number one. Number four, power to fine or imprison for contempt. Okay? Provision number one and provision number four, those two provisions you will find listed in Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. Okay? They don't list the other requirements. Now, provision number five generally has a seal. That means some courts might have a seal, some don't have a seal. <clears throat> One time, I saw, the, uh, I saw the clerk stamp a seal on a paper in the United States District Court. Okay, the court seal of the United States District Court. You know what it was? It was a rubber stamp. And she stamped it, and when she removed the stamp, it left the, the ink, with ink, it left the word seal. That was their seal. I guess they were too poor to afford, you know, the kind that impresses the paper and so forth, because that cost 30 bucks or so, 40 bucks. But you see, a court does not have to have a seal, but it may have a seal. Now, I have a seal, okay? When I, when I uh, file my court papers, Anytime I issue an order, I have a seal, sovereign seal. It says seal. <laughs> it, it has my name on it, has my date of birth, okay, the date that I was born. It has uh, some words around, around it. It says wisdom, strength, beauty, you know, that kind of thing, whatever. But the point is, it's my seal. That's what counts. It can be anything you want. It can be any design, but it should have somewhere on it the word seal, okay? That Because some people look at a seal, they don't know it's a seal until you tell them. So you put the word seal on there. Uh, I think all corporate seals are required to have the word seal. And, you know, you always see that word somewhere, like the great seal of the United States or the great seal of California. It has the word seal in there. Otherwise, I guess it's not a seal. But in any case, the... Um, the, the fifth requirement is uh, optional, but requirements two and three are mandatory. The tribunal is independent of the magistrate, and it's proceeding according to the common law. When you've got those two, that's a killer requirement, believe me. Okay, and I think we're at the end of our recording on this CD or something. Yeah, so we're going to take a short break while he changes CD and gets it set up. Let's make it a, a real five-minute break, okay? <clears throat> okay, well, we got, we got the uh, law notes, okay? And we covered the uh, foundation. And basically, we talked about a court, court of record. The really important thing about a court of record, from our point of view, is the fact that the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. Now, the magistrate is a ministerial office. In other words, he can administer things. He cannot manage things. Management involves judgment and discretion. He can only administer. He can carry out the rules of the court but he cannot make the rules of the court, okay? The tribunal is the one who exercises discretion. Now, what is a magistrate? Well, let's get a little more detail. A magistrate, let's just let's bring it up here, larger. Everybody can read it, I hope. A person clothed with power as a public civil officer. Okay? The tribunal is the one who does the judging. The tribunal has to be independent of that person clothed, clothed with power as a public civil officer. What does clothed with power mean? Remember the legal definition of power? It means 
the authority to make law, right? The source of the power. Well, reading this, you would think that he could make law. Well, he can't really. He's not a legislature. So there's, there's restrictions on what he can do. But he is not the tribunal. See, to be a court of record, you've got to have the one doing the judging independent of the one who's conducting the proceedings, the magistrate. <coughs> now, if you... And it's a public officer belonging to the civil organization of the judicial, legislative, or executive. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. Public officer belonging to the civil organization of the state and invested with powers and functions which may be either judicial, legislative, or executive. But the term is commonly used in a narrower sense, designating in England a person entrusted with a commission of the peace. In other words, a cop, I guess. Um, and in America, one of the class of inferior judicial officers, such as justices of the peace and police justices. Okay? Okay. The word magistrate does not necessarily imply an officer exercising any judicial functions and might very well be held to embrace notaries and commissioners of deeds. See? It's a magistrate. So, I'm a notary, so I'm a magistrate. Okay? So, that's the general meaning of the word magistrate. But, we can get more specific than that. For example, uh... Right here, California Penal Code, section 807, magistrate is defined, <coughs> is an officer having power to issue a warrant for the arrest of a person charged with a public offense. <coughs> Who are the persons magi designated as magistrates? Well, the judges of the Supreme Court, the judges of the Courts of Appeal, the Superior Courts, Municipal Courts, and the Justice Courts. They're all magistrates. Now, if they are all magistrates, and if the Constitution of California specifically designates that all courts are courts of record, and if a court of record is one in which the tribunal is independent of the magistrate, then what power does a judge have to make any decisions? None. Right. Okay? So, if he doesn't have any power, who is the tribunal? Well, it has to be the sovereign. Well, the problem they have is, is that you can't, in a practical term, the state cannot prosecute anybody in a court of record. They've got to go borrow some sovereign somewhere or, in the alternative, assemble a jury of sovereigns. Right? I question whether or not we have real sovereigns on the juries because they all receive a, a stipend. A what? Stipend. So much per day. Oh, I see. They get money each day for their, their, their... I think they call it reimbursement of expenses, but there's no itemization of the expenses. It's just a general amount that's paid to everybody. Okay? So I have a lot of doubt as to the validity of that. And you see, they... There are some very intelligent people, apparently, who thought this all out. And uh, you'll notice that they have arraignments in the criminal courts. Why do they have arraignment? Because they want you to agree to step out of a court of record and allow them to sit in judgment of your case. They, they want the magistrate to also be the tribunal, but they can't do it without your agreement. And this whole code system that they have set up is just that, a code system. It's not law. It's a contract. And you contract to an, when you go through arraignment. 